Hello and welcome to the uh, Sunday of the Passion. Uh, sometimes this is called Palm Sunday, particularly if you have the procession of palms. And while I do have a palm plant behind me there, it's not really something I can carry and wave in front of Jesus. So we're uh, instead we're just going to do the Sunday of the Passion, and uh, you'll see that that's uh, very enriching but quite long. Uh, because the uh, historic practice of the church for the last 1,700 years, pretty much, has been to read the entire uh, Passion account on this day. And so you're going to kind of get a, a, a Palm Sunday all the way through till uh, uh, the Easter Vigil uh, all at once here. So we're going to go through Jesus' um, last hours, his betrayal, his... Uh, execution and his burial. Uh, and yet, what a wonderful thing that is, because we know what comes after. Uh, so, with that being said, we are following the Order of Divine Service, setting three on page 184, for the last time for quite a while, actually. Uh, we'll take it up again way after the Easter season is done. Um, and so, the Holy Week has its own special services, and then uh, from Easter onward, we're, we're going to be using uh, Divine Service Setting 1. So, yeah, uh, so we got lots to do, so let's not tarry. Let's begin. Our hymn of invocation for this Sunday of the Passion is number 442, All Glory, Laud, and Honor, number 442. <laughs> With palms before you went Our praise and prayer and anthems Before you we present All glory, Lord, and honor To you, Redeemer King To whom the lips of children Made sweet hope Hosanna's ring to you before your passion they sang their hymns of praise to you now high exalted our melody we raise all glory Hosanna's ring as you receive. 
receive their praises Accept the prayers we bring O source of every blessing Our good and gracious King All glory, Lord, and honor To you, Redeemer King To whom the lips of children Made sweet hosanna In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them and I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Brothers and sisters, if this is your penitent confession, then hear the good news. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our introit for today is drawn upon portions of Psalm 22. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of wild oxen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you, and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our flesh, and to suffer death upon the cross. Mercifully grant that we may follow the example of his great humility and patience, and be made partakers of his resurrection, 
through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our prophecy for the Sunday of the Passion is from the prophet Zechariah, the ninth chapter. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The bow of war will be removed, and he will proclaim peace to the nations. His dominion will extend from sea to sea, from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of your covenant, I will release your prisoners from the waterless cistern. Return to a stronghold, you prisoners who have hope. Today I declare that I will restore double to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm for this Sunday of the Passion is from Psalm 118, verses 19 to 29. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders reject, rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Our epistle for the Sunday of the Passion is from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our tract for today is verses 1, 4, and 5 of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? In you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 26th and 27th chapters. Oh. 
When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he told his disciples, You know that the Passover takes place after two days, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the courtyard of the high priest, who was named Caiaphas, and they conspired to arrest Jesus in a treacherous way and kill him. Not during the festival, they said, so there won't be rioting among the people. While Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman approached him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. She poured it on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw it, they were indignant. Why this waste? they asked. This might have been sold for a great deal and given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a noble thing for me. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. By pouring this perfume on my body, she has prepared me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole of the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, the man called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they weighed out thirty pieces of silver for him. And from that time, he started looking for a good opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Go into the city to a certain man, he said, and tell him, The teacher says, My time is near. I am celebrating the Passover at your place with my disciples. So the disciples did just as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, he was reclining at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. Deeply distressed, each one began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. He replied, The one who dipped his hand with me in the bowl, he will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for him if he had not been born. Judas, his betrayer, replied, Surely not I, Rabbi. You have said it, he told him. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, Tonight all of you will fall away because of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you to Galilee, Peter told him. Even if everyone falls away because of you, I will never fall away. Truly, I tell you, Jesus said to him, Tonight, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Even if I have to die with you, Peter told him, I will never deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he told the disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. Taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He said to them, I am gre deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. <laughs> Going a little farther, he fell face down and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. He asked Peter, So couldn't you stay awake with me one hour? <laughs> stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed. My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, 
your will be done. And he came again and found them sleeping because they could not keep their eyes open. After leaving them, he went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? See, the time is near. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let's go. See, my betrayer is near. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, suddenly arrived. A large mob with swords and clubs was with him from the chief priests and the elders of the people. His betrayer had given them a sign. The one I kiss, he's the one. Arrest him. So immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Friend, Jesus asked him, Why have you come? Then they came up, took a hold of Jesus, and arrested him. At that moment, one of those with Jesus reached out his hand and drew his sword. He struck the high priest's servant and cut off his ear. Then Jesus told him, Put your sword back in its place, because all who take up the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot call on my father, and he will provide me here and now with more than twelve legions of angels? How then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? At that time Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a criminal to capture me? Every day I used to sit teaching in the temple, and you didn't arrest me. But all this has happened so that the writings of the prophets would be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and ran away. Those who had arrested Jesus led him away to Caiaphas the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had convened. Peter was following him at a distance right to the high priest's courtyard. He went in and was sitting with the servants to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they could not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came, who came forward stated, This man said, I can destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. The high priest stood up and said to him, Don't you have an answer to what these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you were the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said it, Jesus told him. But I tell you, in the future you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? See, now you've heard the blasphemy. What is your decision? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spat in his face and beat him. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah. Who was it that hit you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl approached him and said, You were with Jesus the Galilean, too. But he denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about. When he had gone out to the gateway, another woman saw him and told those who were there, This man was with Jesus the Nazarene. And again he denied it with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there approached and said to Peter, You really are one of them, since even your accent gives you away. Then he started to curse and to swear with an oath, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. When daybreak came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. After tying him up, they led him away and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that Jesus had been condemned, was full of remorse and returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. I have sinned by betraying innocent blood, he said. What's that to us? they said. See to it yourself. So he threw the silver into the temple and departed. Then he went and hanged himself. The chief priest took the silver and said, It's not permitted to put it into the temple treasury since it is blood money. They conferred together and 
bought the potter's field with it as a burial place for foreigners. Therefore that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him whose price was set by the Israelites, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. Now Jesus stood before the governor. Are you the king of the Jews? The governor asked him. Jesus answered, you say so. While he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he didn't answer. Then Pilate said to him, don't you hear how much they are testifying against you? But he didn't answer him on even one charge, so that the governor was quite amazed. At the festival, the governor's custom was to release to the crowd a prisoner they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who is it you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew it was because of envy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judge's bench, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for today I've suffered terribly in a dream because of him. The chief priests and the elders, however, persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to execute Jesus. The governor asked them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? Barabbas, they answered. Pilate answered then, What should I do then with Jesus who is called Christ? They all answered, Crucify him! Then he said, Why? What has he done wrong? But they kept shouting all the more, Crucify him! When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that a riot was starting instead, he took some water, washed his hands in front of the crowd, and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. All the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them and, after having Jesus flogged, handed him over to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the governor's residence and gathered the whole company around him. They stripped him and dressed him in a scarlet robe. They twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and placed a staff in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews! Then they spat on him, took the staff, and kept hitting him on the head. After they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they found a Cyrenian man named Simon. They forced him to carry his cross. When they came to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they gave him wine mixed with gall to drink, but when he tasted it, he refused to drink it. After crucifying him, they divided his clothes by casting lots. Then they sat down and were guarding him there. Above his head, they put up the charge against him in writing. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two criminals were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. Those who passed by were yelling insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him and said, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now, if he takes pleasure in him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, even the criminals who were crucified with him taunted him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the whole land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and offered him a drink. But the rest said, Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. But Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. Suddenly the curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split. 
The tombs were also opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And they came out of the tombs after his resurrection, entered the holy city, and appeared to many. When the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they were terrified and said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Many women who had followed Jesus from Galilee looked after him were there, watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. When it was evening, a rich man from Arimathea came, named Joseph came, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. He approached Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Then Pilate ordered that it be released. So Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean, fine linen, and placed it in his new tomb, which he had cut into the rock. He left after rolling a great stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were seated there, facing the tomb. The next day, which followed the preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that while this deceiver was still alive, he said, After three days I will rise again. So give orders that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come, steal him, and tell the people, He has been raised from the dead and the last deception will be worse than the first. You have a guard of soldiers, Pilate told them. Go and make it as secure as you know how. They went and secured the tomb by setting a seal on the stone and placing the guards. Praise. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our hymn of the day today is number 438, A Lamb Goes Uncomplaining Forth. Number 438. Stripes, the wounds, the lies. 
besides the mockery and yet replies all this I gladly suffer this lamb is Christ the soul's great friend the send to gain for us his favor go forth my son the father said and free my children from their dread of guilt and condemnation the wrath and strife are hard to bear but by your passion they will share the fruit of your salvation yes father yes most will to your decree I'll do what you have asked me oh wondrous love what have you done the father offers up his son desiring our salvation strong you are to save you lay the one in to the grave who built the earth's foundation Lord when your glory I shall see and taste your kingdom's pleasure your blood my royal robe shall be my joy beyond all measure when i appear before your throne your righteousness shall be my crown with these I need not hide me and there in garments richly wrought as your own bride shall we be brought to stand in joy beside Grace, peace, and mercy be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, when I was living in Calgary while going to school, I had a roommate who loved mountain climbing. He encouraged me to go to the climbing wall at the university and learn how to climb as well. So I did. It was good exercise and good fellowship with the other climbers, and soon I learned that I had zero fear of heights. More on that in a minute. So month by month, I got better at rope climbing and then free climbing, that is, climbing without ropes, and soon I was ready to head into the Rocky Mountains. After several successful group climbs, I started climbing on my own, and I took on well, honestly, larger and more challenging mountains fairly quickly, probably far quicker than I ever should have. So one day I decided to climb Mount Baker along the Continental Divide. 
this was going to be my best climb ever. Well, after about four hours, I was three quarters of the way up the mountain, over two and a half kilometers above the ground. And at this point, one of my cams, the, the little gears that you use to attach my rope to the mountain, came out. And as it did, I started to fall. And as I fell, several more cams were juke, jerked loose and uh, came out because the rock was unstable. And I fell further and further. Finally, a cam did its job and held, and I stopped falling. I then smacked into the face of the mountain quite hard and was knocked unconscious. I woke up after some period of time hanging on the side of a mountain, over 2,000 meters off the ground. And I realized that I had several broken ribs along with who knows what else. However, this was a solo climb. Nobody even knew that I was out there except the ranger that I had reported in with when I approached the divide. So either I climbed down myself or I was going to die stuck there like a fly on a piece of flypaper. So eventually I got down to ground. However, I passed out at least three or four more times on the way down from the pain. And it took me hours and hours to get down. Usually getting down is the easy part. And once I was down, I remember laying on the ground for more than 45 minutes or so, laughing in my head as I cried on the outside, asking God to just take me home. Now, oh God, he didn't answer the way I wanted. By that I mean he left me there. So I pulled myself up and very slowly hiked and kind of crawled my way back to my Monte Carlo so that I could drive out of the park. And it was pitch black by the time I got to the car. And somehow I managed to stay conscious while driving and made it to Banff. And when I was checked out at their hospital, they shipped me off via ambulance to Calgary. And here's another sad or funny part of the story, depending on how you look at it. Uh, once I got to the emergency room, the doctor comes in and actually starts laughing. Now I've got cuts on my head and face. Uh, busted ribs, and I'm pretty sure I've done damage to my back. Uh, my knee was already all swollen up, and my doctor starts laughing, which doesn't do a whole lot for your ego. Now, it turns out that the doctor was someone I knew. He was, in fact, the father of one of my friends, Neil, and he told me months before that climbing was reckless and dangerous and that I should not do it. Obviously, he was right. This was, in fact, the last time that I climbed a mountain. Then the kicker, and the one thing I remember ever so clearly, was that after he finishes laughing and he kind of looks at the broken extremities, um, he tells me that he wants to examine my head. I've got broken bones and this doctor wants to examine my head. Now I'm not quite certain if he was just worried about the distance I fell, or was worried about why in the world I would ever want to do what I had just spent that day doing. Anyway, on that particular day I had to have my entire head examined. So, yes, a long story about a silly event. But isn't that the truth about all of us? Don't we, in the midst of our brokenness, sometimes need to have our heads examined? After all, think for a moment about today. We started this moment with a song singing, All glory, laud, and honor to you, Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet hosannas ring. And then, if we step back and read what happens over the next few days, we find betrayal, denial, abandonment, crucifixion. <sighs> and you know, this applies to us, because yes, we come to church, maybe even study the Bible a little, for the most part claim to believe that Jesus is the Savior. We shout over and over again, save us, save us, and God does, through this holiest of weeks. We call it the passion of Jesus Christ, God's passionate love for me, for you. If people only had the slightest idea of what happened some 2,000 years ago during this week, the churches would be packed today, jammed to the gills on Monday, Thursday, overflowing on Good Friday, and standing room only at Easter. Next Sunday, you would have to leave for service one hour early simply because of the traffic, and finding a place to park would be a nightmare. However, we all know good and well that this will not be the case. Why? Is it because we just don't know the story? Or is it simply because we need our heads examined? 
Well, I can't do anything about your heads, but I can do something about the story part. You see, Jesus had just spent the better part of three years teaching through words and action what the kingdom of God should look like. Where the sick are healed, bones are mended, demons are driven out, hungry crowds are fed, forgiveness is offered to the unforgivable, love is shown to the unlovable, and the dead are raised. And now, today, this king on a donkey rides into Jerusalem, knowingly riding to his death. This Thursday, we're going to celebrate this Lamb of God giving us a new commandment. That's what Mondi means in Latin, a new command. To love God and love one another, sharing with us his body, his blood, washing his disciples' feet, so you and I may be willing and able to continue the work of Jesus in the world, sharing what the kingdom of God should look like now through our words and action. And yet on this very same night, Jesus is betrayed by his own disciple for 30 pieces of silver, denied by his closest friend, abandoned by every one of his followers. He's dragged away as a criminal for committing no crime. This silent, innocent king stands in front of earthly powers where he is beaten, spat upon, and found guilty. Then on Good Friday, the Son of God will have a crown of thorns placed on his head, nails driven into his hands and feet, and crucified, executed for me, for you. You see, if we truly owned this passionate story in our hearts and our minds, it would not only have to make a huge difference in our lives, but in the world. So one must conclude that either we don't know, don't believe the story, or by golly, we simply need our heads examined. A few months ago, I had a young woman come and see me, kind of out of the blue, as about, I'm going to say, half of my counseling uh, patients uh, come. This poor person was having the life beat out of her. Both her and her husband worked at the same place, and they both lost their jobs. They were fighting like crazy. The banks were threatening to take away their cars and their home. Her son was in an automobile accident and was in danger of losing a leg. The poor thing was at her wit's end. So we went into the sanctuary and prayed. I told her about the hope that God gives in hopeless situations. I gave her information about our churches, and because she wasn't from this town, I gave her some some uh, information on the churches in Listowel. I went and visited her son in the hospital. And it turns out, for a while at least, every Sunday she came faithfully to worship in Listowel. And one particular day, I saw her in Walmart. Now, the pastor in Listowel had mentioned that he hadn't seen her at church for a few weeks, so I asked her how things were going. She claimed everything was all better now. Both her and her husband were rehired at the company. Her relationship with her husband had improved, and her son was doing just fine now, was healing rapidly and was walking around on two legs. And then she said something that was shocking at the time, but no longer shocks me. She said, you probably won't be seeing me in church anymore. I don't know what I was thinking. Maybe I was just worrying too much. After all, things just have a way of working themselves out. Right, Pastor? Yeah. We shout, save us, save us. And God does this in one holy week. What then do we do? Do we continually betray Jesus like Judas for 30 pieces of silver, seeking things instead of peace and understanding? Do we abandon him like the disciples, going on about our daily lives as if Jesus never did ride into town? And some of us, like Peter, deny even knowing Jesus. Some of us may spit on his name by our thoughts. In effect, even though Jesus is trying to save us, we yell, Crucify him! Crucify him! Over and over, week after week, we once again nail the Son of God to the cross with our daily lives, just like the crowds and the Romans. Ouch, huh? Yet here's the amazing part of the story. Even though, and even through our betrayal, fear, denial, and abandonment, even through the spitting on his name, nailing the one who saves us on a cross, this conquering Christ, Jesus riding on a donkey, is still, let me repeat, is still willing to suffer and climb up that tree and die for you, so that you may experience the abundance of life here and now, and eternal life in the world yet to come. 
Now that's what I call gospel. Good news that the world cannot offer in any shape or form. Not through our wealth or career, not even through family or friends. It is offered only through the passion of Jesus Christ. This week we not only make it a priority to attend all the Holy Week services, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter, I challenge you to think long and carefully how you respond to the only one who can heal our brokenness and save our sorry souls. Think long and carefully about the fact that you have a God willing to overlook your tremendous shortcomings and give you life through his death. And folks, if the passion story does not change the way you think and live, if the cross, the life, death, and resurrection of Christ Jesus does not make you realize the love of God, then maybe, just maybe, you really do need to have your head examined. Hosanna. Save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Church of Christ, that her faith would remain fixed upon his death for our salvation, and that his gospel would be proclaimed and lived out until he comes again in glory, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the world, that the Lord would uphold it in his order, for the church, that she would be defended from all enemies. For our homes, that God would bless parents and children in service toward each other and faith until life's end. And for the government, that God would grant all authorities health and wisdom. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For a mind like Christ Jesus to spur in all worldly equality, that we would humble ourselves here and find a greater portion in the life of the world to come. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who suffer in this world, especially Pastor Ballantine, Lundy Priestap, David Rich, Lauren Schmidt, Judy Scheel, Elizabeth Winkler, Vera Ahrens, Eric and Paula Hins, Norma Rose, Renata Rose, Ron Rose, Lois Carter, Artis Herman, Susanna Kingsbury, and Adelia Meyer, that they would not fear but fix their eyes on Jesus as they await the fullness of their salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We praise you, Father, that you have sent your Son not in wrath, but in mercy. As we enter this most holy week and ponder together the mysteries of your great salvation, show us the answer to your people's prayers of Hosanna in the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen Almighty and merciful God, we have again worshipped in your presence and received both forgiveness for our many sins and the assurance of your love in Jesus Christ. We thank you for this undeserved grace and ask you to keep us in faith until we inherit eternal salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen, amen, amen. Our hymn to depart today is number 441, Ride On, Ride On in Majesty. Number 441. Hark all the tribes, Hosanna cry, O Savior, meek, pursue thy road with palms and scattered garments strode. Ride on, ride on in majesty, in lowly pomp, ride on to die. O Christ, thy triumphs now begin, or captive death and conquered sin. Ride on, ride on in majesty, the angel armies of the sky look down with sad and wondering eyes to see the approaching sacrifice. Ride on, ride on in majesty, thy last and fiercest strife is nigh. The Father on his sapphire throne awaits his own anointed Son. In lowly pomp, ride on to die. Bow thy meek hand to mortal pain. Then take, O oh God, thy power and reign. Thank you so much for coming and being a part of this as we celebrate this passion of our Christ. Even as we bemoan the fact that he had to die in order to save us, we are so thankful that our Father in heaven did send Jesus. And even as he rode in on majesty, of course, he rode out again in majesty as he ascended into heaven. But in between, we have this period, this passion, this suffering of Christ. And so we thank our Lord and Father, for Je for our God in heaven, for sending Jesus and we thank Jesus for being willing to drink that cup of sorrow. With that being said, God bless you all, and I hope to see have you here again as we go through the rest of Holy Week. Amen. Mm -hmm.